I've always looked upon diving as simply a method to get to where I want to be. To where I worked, where I look, look at things and study things. And you always find new things. Even after nearly 50 years in the water, I'm always still finding new things. I've collected thousands of new species. I've uh, had hundreds and hundreds of them described and I've had 13 of them named after me. Probably any diver in Tasmania has seen the golden zoanthid. It's a little colonial anemone that we have around here. That's a very common species, but it was only described a few years ago and that was named after me. In my lifetime, I've made a dent, but uh, it's unfortunately, we're not in a position to keep going with some of that stuff because we're literally losing the expertise that we've got. In southern Australia, just looking shallow water, and I'm talking here from intertidal and down, maybe down to you know, 20, 30 metres, we can pro probably put names on possibly 30% of the species that we have. The other 70% we do not have names for. They are undescribed. And as the climate's changing so fast, they're actually becoming extinct before we even know that they're there. We started the dive centre in 1991. I've been diving, of course, around Tassie for a long time. It'll be pretty well 50 years as of now. And of all the areas around Tasmania that had the diversity that this little area has, it's second to none, I would say, pretty well anywhere. Most people we get here are international and interstate on our visitors, and they want to see somewhere different. People started to appreciate that the kelp forest was a different environment. And it was an experience unlike anything they'd ever done. You dive in the giant kelp forest, you can literally compare it to flying through a rainforest. The light that moving through the canopy formed all sorts of, of patterns and colours and, and absolutely fascinating stuff. And then you had all the life that was living in amongst it. We used to get people who would just be wowed with that. And it became an iconic dive. And the same as people travel to see the big trees in the Styx forest, they would travel to dive in the kelp forest. We had forests, kelp forests here, you know, in our diving area, 10 kilometres to the north, way down 20 kilometres to the south. The, the giant kelp used to be so thick down here, you couldn't drive a boat through it, you couldn't put a pot in it, you couldn't set a net in it, you couldn't operate a hooker diving gear through it. So basically it acted as a natural nursery in its own accord. And then over a period of oh, about 15 to 20 years, it's all disappeared. So that's all gone. Little grandchildren now, they're six and three, they will not see what I took for granted. And that's in one lifetime. One lifetime, everything's completely changed. This is in June 2013. But there's the forest in the background. Went from a forest like that in early December of 2015. By end of March in 16, there was not a single plant left. 
the threats that we have to the giant kelp forest are fairly and squarely climate change. It's not just the warmer water, it's not just the other species coming in here, it's not just the lack of nutrient that comes from a lack of upwelling because of current changes. It's a combination of all of those things. We still get requests. I want to come and die the kelp forest. And you've got to inform them accordingly. On average, to dive in the giant kelp forest inquiries, we're dealing with at least four or five a week. People ring up saying, I want to go diving in the kelp forest. And you've got to explain that it's no longer here. A lot of people are shocked. Some people have read that it's, you know, a lot of people ring up now saying, oh, well, here it's di disappearing. I want to dive it before it's gone. I said, well, sorry, unfortunately, you're too late. And their response to that is that there are a percentage of those people who just don't come because it's gone. The, the point is that our government declared the giant kelp forest as a threatened ecosystem. What they did about it was absolutely zilch. And until we actually do something constructively about that, then that ecosystem itself will remain threatened. When you're intervening with nature on a big scale, you've got to have a go. Otherwise, you'll never find out. It's going to take a lot of effort. Our window of opportunity is rapidly closing. In a small time scale, I would very much like to see a few places set aside to allow this stuff to grow, because I know we can do it. The results, to me, are uh, extremely promising. We are starting to get calls from people who have heard that we are uh, involved in trying to restore some of the kelp and they're interested in diving, having a look at that. Now, if we were able to get to the point where we even had a small area of a restored forest to be able to showcase, people will come and appreciate it and they will talk about it and that makes a difference and the more that's out there the more people appreciate it and the more people see what's there. By making an effort you can intervene and you can help in a small way. Now even if that's just an area of kelp forest that it may only be a small area that we can keep going and keep alive and can show people and until you can show them that, you can talk to your blue in the face, but until they can actually see that happening, you know, people won't get in involved, they won't get in engaged unless they can actually see it and feel it themselves. The more we can do that, the more people turn around and say, I want to make a difference. <laughs>